Hello. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the CNPS uh, Riverside San Bernardino uh, Zoom channel. Um, before we get started, I want to um, celebrate uh, and recognize that today is the first Juneteenth, um, the new federal holiday, and, and this is the first one celebrating the 1865 announcement of the abolition of slavery in Texas and, of course, throughout the United States. So happy Juneteenth, everyone. Um, uh, thanks for joining us for Biodiversity Now with David Newsom. I want to take a moment to welcome any of you who are new to the California Native Plant Society and tell you a bit about our organization and our favorite topic, native plants. California's native plants are what make California look like California, from the Joshua Tree of the Mojave Desert to the redwood forests of the North Coast. We're lucky to live in one of the most botanically rich places on earth with more types of native plants than any other state in the US. That's right. And in fact, I have, I have been told that we have more native plants than all the other states in the continental US combined. Uh, at CNPS, we think that's something worth celebrating and protecting, and we invite you to join us. CNPS is a nonprofit organization made up of more than 10,000 members, 35 local chapters, and a team of staff. Together, we're working to conserve wildlands, protect endangered species, collect scientific data, and restore nature to our home and public landscapes, one garden at a time. We are the voice for plants. Um, if you're inspired by what you see and hear today, please consider getting involved. Become a member by visiting cnps.org forward slash join or sign up to receive our emails and learn more about what we're doing at cnps.org forward slash get dash connected. Um, so uh, before we start our program, uh, I'd like to introduce everyone who's helping uh, to put it on today. We have Ed, who's renamed California Native Plant Society. And he's our tech host. And, um, and hi, Ed. And if Ed drops in, you know we're, we might be having a little trouble. Um, and then we have Katie Barrows, our past president, and she will be taking questions in the Q&A. So please, if you can, put your questions in the Q&A and they will be uh, uh, addressed at the end. Katie? Yeah. OK, so and then um, our speaker. Uh, speaking, speaking of restoring nature to our home and public landscapes one garden at a time, our, our speaker David Newsom is the father of two wild ones, a husband and an avid outdoorsman. He founded the Wild Yards Project in 2017 after watching his own sterile urban backyard spring to life courtesy of native plants, a lot of love and a steady supply of clean water. A 30 years veteran of film and TV, David draws on his past to spread the story of the native habitat movement far and wide. The Wild Yards Project combines storytelling, public outreach, community gardens, and consultation to help retrofit biodiverse habitat into urban and suburban spaces. David believes madly, deeply in story, especially the ones that change the world. Over to you, David. Right on, thank you so much for that. It's really fun to be here. Um, I'm gonna give me a second here to tech out. And I think that should put us all in pretty good shape. Does that look about right to everyone? Looks good. <clears throat> okay, great. Um, <clears throat> you know, first of all, something I wanna be very clear about is I'm not a botanist. I wasn't a horticulturalist. I didn't know anything. As a guy who had been hiking and traveling and spending a lot of time outdoors, I, I knew embarrassingly little <clears throat> about the plants and animals of California, even though I had lived here for a long time before I started my garden. Um, but when my kids were born, uh, when we bought our, when we were about to have our daughter, um, 
that all changed. And so this is that story. And we're gonna cover a lot of things because I think that native plants have an enormous amount of, of power and they give us all an enormous amount of agency to change the story of what's gonna happen in our time. And so what I'm really interested in is that story and how we think about native plants, creating native ecosystems and how those native ecosystems that we retrofit into our urban and suburban world can radically change what's happening in our natural world. So I grew up in New Jersey and I grew up in the Jersey suburbs um, where you had row after row after row after row of split level ranch houses. And then there'd be a hurricane fence and then there'd be a giant field with an old farm or you know, just a secondary or tertiary forest. And in those forests back then, there was still a lot of wildlife. And one of the most iconic creatures for me from that time was box turtles. This is a male Eastern box turtle. And uh, every time I stumbled upon them and I stumbled upon them quite frequently, I was always filled with awe. I just love them. They're such magical creatures. But all the rivers and all the little streams by my house and all the ponds were filled with life. And so even though my house represented um, the eradication of an enormous amount of wild land after World War II, uh, it still provided me an, a very powerful baseline of experience with the natural world that has shaped the way I think about things. Um, and many decades later, my wife was pregnant with our daughter and we knew we A, needed a place to live and, um, but also B, I began to wonder about uh, what my daughter's baseline experience of the natural world was gonna be. Um, and that really got me perseverating. I tend to obsess and uh, I began to obsess on what wildness my daughter was gonna know in the 21st century. So we bought a house um, here in Northeast Los Angeles. There's your flipper, there's your flipper, your flipper yard. Um, sod with no irrigation. I'm not sure what the plan was there. But our home is uh, then the, the shelter under which these two critters lie. And uh, my son and daughter are 21 months apart. And even though we live in the embrace of this beautiful coastal sage scrub, this Mediterranean chaparral, um, our neighborhood is a very, very busy urban center. And that's what it looks like from the air. Uh, a pretty tough place for a bird. And, and by the way, this is a very green neighborhood compared to a lot of the neighborhoods <clears throat> in Los Angeles and across the country. Um, and this was our yard when we inherited it. Um, pretty dried out, pretty burned out soil. Um, but we had a yard and it was kind of a big blank slate. And the first thing that I started to think about was where are my kids' box turtles? What's going to be their baseline experience with nature? Because even though we live in Southern California, which is one of the most biodiverse places in the world, and we'll talk about that later, um, my neighborhood and my yard, not so much. So I went on a journey to figure out how to bring wildlife into our yard. And the first thing we did was have a pollinator garden. Yeah, I went to I went to Armstrong's and I bought a bunch of pollinator plants and I put them in the ground. And that was like my, that was my gateway drug to where I am now and the habitat garden. And we had some success with it. Obviously we, we attracted a bunch of bees. I didn't even understand native bees or, or, or what the difference was between honeybees and native bees. Um, we raised some monarchs and, but I also began to realize that there was a very limited palette of insects coming into our yard. And that made me curious. And so uh, then someone told me to get this book, Bees in Your Backyard. It's in my hand, we can talk about it later. And I realized that there's probably 160 bees endemic to Los Angeles alone. So that made me sort of nosedive into a conversation about 
native plants, which I thought was totally exotic and strange, ironically. So these are the people that taught, got me started on my journey. The first person was, uh, is an author and uh, naturalist writer and science writer named David Quammen. And he, um, one of the most respected uh, nature writers of our time, seminal works in, on biodiversity, extinction, viruses. He wrote Spillover in 2012, which is an acclaimed New York Times bestseller. In 1998, he published an essay in Harper's Magazine called Planet of Weeds. And that article was all about how weed species, if left unchecked, will radically alter our landscape and, and create monocultures where there are now diverse and biodiverse ecosystems. Then there was, of course, someone said, oh, you should look at the National Wildlife Certified Habitat Program. So I looked into that, and that was very interesting. And then I had the opportunity to hear Doug Talamay speak about plant and insect coevolution, the coevolution and the interdependence of specialized uh, relationships between plants and insects, and how important native plants are to maintaining a robust ecosystem. So that was the first, that was the first talk that I'd ever heard that shifted me powerfully away from a drought tolerant garden, a zero escape garden, a pollinator garden, and just think native habitat. What is native habitat? And one of the th first um, people that I came upon is of course Carol Bornstein and a lot of her seminal work and actually working with native plants and creative native uh, choosing plants for the garden Native Plants for the Garden. I think I have her book. I have a bunch of books and we can talk about those at the end. But these were sort of the four big seminal ideas that got me going. So reconciliation ecology is really what every, everyone's talking about. And reconciliation ecology is the science of inventing, establishing and maintaining habitats to conserve diversity in places where people live, work and play. So it's not about maintaining systems that we're in a civilized space and nature occurs out there. The idea is that we are an expression of nature and we can retrofit biodiversity where we live. Um, and that was, that was a, a term coined by Dr. Michael Rosenzweig in 2002. He also did a lot of data about what space in the United States was still actually wild. And he came up with basically that there's only 4% uncorrupted wild space left in the United States. The other 96% has been disturbed, lost to cities, suburbs, farmland, timber, and grazing. <clears throat> so that number made a huge impression on me. About 90% of all leaf eating insects rely upon native plants for food. An average pair of nesting birds consumes between 6,000 and 9,000 caterpillars per clutch. This is all information from Doug Talamay. Habitat loss drives catastrophic declines. We know that 40%, uh, 3 billion birds lost since 1970. Um, roughly 29% of all species worldwide, 40% of all known insect species are in serious decline. And if you look at these two carpenter bees mating on my sage, it's not like the bees aren't doing their best. It's not their fault. They're doing everything they can. I also just noticed in this picture that there's, a, there's an aphid up on that bud. So I think most of us in this conversation know the statistics on lawns and why this is a giant issue, but I'll blow through them really fast just to refresh our minds. 40 million acres of lawn in the United States and more being, uh, design daily. They consume up to 10 billion gallons of fresh water daily. They use 80 million pounds of pesticides a year, 90 million pounds of chemical fertilizers. They're responsible for 5% of our carbon emissions. Um, that's all uh, data gathered from the Deep Roots Project. A study by UC Davis found that the average American child in Southern California uses their lawn at aggregate total of 40 minutes a week. So I think that changed during COVID. And adults use their lawn about 10 minutes. And of that, they use about, uh, I think roughly the number is like 30%. The rest of it is just there. We live in California coastal sage scrub. It's our true home. Uh, it's one of, the, it's uh, one of the most biodiverse regions in the United States. Uh, Orchid already pointed out how many species are endemic to this region. I think 30% of all the plants 
in our true home are endemic only uh, to California. And I think for some 40% of the animal species as well. Um, so it's a gem. It's an incredible gem that we should be inviting into our yard, not pushing out. Um, it's also a biodiversity hotspot and a biodiversity hotspot um, is basically a region that has to meet two strict criteria. Uh, it must contain at least 150,000 species of vascular plants as endemic. It means relative only to that place and have lost at least 75% of its primary vegetation. And as you can see, if you look at a taxonomic map of the United States, these are all, this is shared taxonomy by this coloration. This green is shared taxonomy, plant and animal species. And as you get into California, we don't share much with a lot of other places. We have hyper specific, um, taxonomy. And so that means it's very, very fragile. It doesn't exist anywhere else. And it's very important. We live in the embrace of an incredible gem with this coastal sage scrub biome. David Quammen has a great quote, islands are where species go to die. And that doesn't mean literally, although it is literal. Uh, if you're studying Hawaii or if you're studying New Zealand or any of these places, all of their wildlife um, is always at risk because there's no place else for it to go. But fragmentation is what David Quammen was really talking about. And here's just an overview of Northeast LA. And you can see fragmentation in full effect. Um, this is, here you have the San Gabriels. You have over here, Griffith Park, where P22 lives. This is where a vast amount of our um, wildlife occurs for us in Northeast LA. You've got this little bit of forest lawn, which is a completely exotic environment. And you've got Eugene Debs down here, Ernest Debs. Um, and the rest is all us, 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 us. And 98 to 99% of us have incorporated completely exotic ecosystems. In other words, everything that we've just talked about is not supported. It is, it is an exotic environment. Some of it's pollinator based and there, is, there are some nice relationships between some of these plants, but for the most part, we have completely pulled the rug out from under nature in our urban and suburban spaces. And a good example of that is uh, in our neighborhood, you probably read about it on the news last uh, couple months ago, we had one, it turned out to be two bear roaming around right up here on Hill Street, about three blocks above my house, just south of the 134 freeway. So that's a lot of fun and uh, we all enjoyed it very much. But that is a, that's a result of fragmentation. The bear, the bear is foraging, comes down through the Arroyo Seco and finds himself somewhere out in front of the Rose Bowl, makes a wrong turn and is now cut off from his or her foraging areas by the 134 freeway and stuck running around uh, quite nervously through all of Eagle Rock, much to our uh, total amusement, quite frankly. When I began to plant native plants in my yard, this was the first bee that showed up that I was like, I don't know what that is. This is a longhorn summer bee on Cleveland sage and it's a digger bee. And the arrival of this bee and many other native bees in, in subsequent investigations, butterflies, wasps, was my clue that I was on to something. And it was something different than just a pollinator garden. I was now planting plants that were appealing to the native species which relied upon these plants because of these specialized relationships. And this was my first sign that I was having a much deeper connection to the dirt beneath my feet. Um, because fragmentation affects all species. Longhorn bees need habitat as the, in the, and the vast majority of yards in the US and in California don't provide that habitat. I'm gonna quote the Xerces Society here because they talk about the needs of native bees. It's a very powerful site. I really recommend going there and, and uh, scrolling around and learning what you can learn from the Xerces Society about creating uh, appropriate habitat where you live. Uh, native ground nesting bees, which is what a longhorn summer bee is, form small non-aggressive colonies. Ground nesting bees, such as the mining bee that we just saw, are some of the earliest pollinators to, uh, 
to emerge and it makes them some of the most vital pollinators. Everybody credits the honeybee with doing all the pollination, but that's not true at all. Our native bees do a lion's share of the pollinating, both in the big ag sense, but also in just the general sense. Um, so when it comes to ground nesting bees, access to bare ground is essential. And things like mulch and lawns and all those things make that impossible. So the bees are suffering from this fragmentation as well. And that's why we're losing them. We're losing all different kinds of bees that are essential to keeping our plants pollinated, both edibles and non-edibles. This is my yard now. That little, uh, that, that dead strip of sod that you saw before, this is my front yard. This picture was taken a little while ago. And um, as, as, as many people who landscape design for a living will tell you, I overplant. Um, one, I do that because I'm always curious to see what'll work, especially in this location under these two big junipers that create a very acidic environment, a lot of shade. But the other reason is because plant diversity promotes biodiversity. And so as long as the plants have enough space and they're happy, I go for a lot of diversity. Um, and some of the species that I've recorded in this, in the front yard um, are towhees, wrens, hummingbirds, bush tits, warblers, digger bees, leafcutter bees, carpenter bees, bumblebees, alligator lizards. We have Western fence lizards, which just showed up um, in the last two years after I've just been steadily dra been dragging rocks into the garden. Fence lizards really like those stones. And we didn't have any stones when I moved in, so I dragged them all in. Bush Katie did shorthorn grasshoppers, morning cloak butterflies, skippers, painted ladies, hair streaks, monarchs, sulfurs, anyway, and a peahen. For some reason, we had a peahen sleeping right there for a long time. That has nothing to do with anything. I just thought it was weird. This is my backyard. Um, this is a California fescue lawn that does not look anything like this right now. That was, at, that was it at its prettiest. As we say in the entertainment business, that was the pilot. Um, and then surrounded completely with California natives except for this loquat and this jacaranda. Two trees that demand constant cleanup. The cool thing about the backyard now is that we have, uh, things have come into the yard that um, I never even imagined would be possible. We have slender salamanders now living under this Tuyon tree. That is the lungless salamander that lives underground. And uh, once there's a moist environment, an appropriate environment for it, it basically comes out of a, almost like a cryogenic state, a dormant state. And it'll come back up to the surface and spend that season on the surface. And we now have a whole family of slender salamanders living under this toyon and in a couple other spots. Other species that I have recorded in the backyard now, scrub jays, lesser goldfinches, house finches, which I totally admit those two species come to these the feeders. There's a feeder there and a feeder there. And I do that because one, I think when you've displaced 40 million acres of lawn, uh, habitat with lawn, uh, it's the least you could do is feed bees birds and bees and butterflies. The other reason I do it is because wildlife attracts wildlife and birds attract birds. So if you have a big um, native habitat garden, those goldfinches and those house finches will let all the other birds, migratory birds, resident birds, know that there's something going on down here. And those resident birds and migratory birds will find all other kinds of things to feed on. And I'll tell you a cool story about that. But um, wrens, Townsend's warblers, orange crown warblers, ruby, ruby crown kinglets, yellow rumped warblers, bluebirds, hummingbirds, bush tits, digger bees, leaf cutter bees, carpenter bees, bumblebees, alligator lizards, western fence lizard, again, bush katydids, shorthorn grasshoppers, morning cloak butterflies, skippers, painted ladies, hair streaks, monarchs, fritillary skunks, raccoons, opossums, and we now have a resident ground squirrel, which I know some people like don't like ground squirrels, but I think they're the cutest thing in the world. They're like a squirrel that like mated with a hamster. So I like to say that a pollinator garden, if you're just working, if you're just thinking in terms of pollinator plants and not native pollinator plants, 
a pollinator garden are to habitat gardens as a froyo shop is to a village. They provide tasty things, but they don't give you everything you need to survive, right? So a habitat has to offer, has to offer a lot of things that a pollinator garden doesn't. And so pollinator plants are selected for pollen and nectar, but plant communities and a habitat garden provide seeds, leaves to eat, high density, height and density for cover, nesting, perch, and other vital functions. And I want to talk, I'm going to start to like break down and talk about a few of these animals because they're really good signs that you're doing something right in your garden. Obviously the morning cloak on the Phacelia, these are really specialized relationships. And the more native wildflowers you bring into your yard, the more of our indigenous uh, butterflies and bees and things you're going to attract. That's obvious. This story is not so obvious. This is, this is, um, this is red. I, I haven't come up with clever names for the birds that come in our yard, but this is a red-shouldered hawk that would come in and make these very like clumsy attempts at hunting in our yard and fail. 80% I now learned of all hawks die in the first year, 80%. And that's because learning to hunt is extremely hard and they don't have a lot of places to hunt. That's why they're moving actually toward the cities where they can find uh, rats and things like that, uh, other food sources. Um, but what this hawk was doing was coming in, missing at whatever it was going for. And then it was it's right here, it's standing on a branch of an old plum tree that I cut down. And it's only about a foot off the ground, as you can see. And it's looking for bugs. Now that's a pretty ignoble pursuit for a creature, you know, that's as breathtaking as this creature, but it needs to eat and it badly needs protein. And because I let my leaf litter lie, and I don't disturb the soil under my plants, there's a rich um, mycorrhizal and microbial and microfauna condition in my soil. And birds need that. You'll see, so this hawk would jump down and scratch around like a chicken and eat insects. And I like to think that that helped keep it alive for that first year. We still have red-shouldered hawks and uh, Cooper's hawks hunting in our yard all the time. Um, this is a migratory yellow rumped warbler and coming into the water, fresh clean running water is a really essential element of a habitat garden. It's one of the most important things. Birds, bees, butterflies, everything needs water. Even if you live uh, a little closer to like where coyotes or skunks or raccoons, they need water. This is cool to me because this is a sweat bee, one of the more resplendent sweat bees. It's on my Areogonum rubescens. Something to know about native bees is that unlike honeybees, they don't have this vast range. They, they fly very short distances, right? And so for a native bee to be at your garden, it means it's found some place to live. It's found a food source and often it's found a place where it can burrow, or be in a hole in wood, things like that. So the more native bees you have in your garden, the, the better a sign it is that you're doing something right in terms of habitat, you're providing a space for them. So that's good work. Um, it's really important to point out that even though we have a big habitat garden, our habitat is for our kids too. It's for our family and it's for our friends. And so uh, like the SAQs to care a big part for me of the buy-in of Habitat Garden is making sure that you're creating a space that people can interact with. A few more stories. I love this one. So this is Coop and Coop learned to hunt in our yard. And we now have a pretty, that was probably, that started about, I guess in 2019, I started to notice the hawks coming into our yard. Unlike uh, the red-shouldered hawk, Cooper's hawks are aerial feeders. They have a slightly extended talon that they use just like an outfielder to pull birds out of the sky. Uh, it's a pretty stunning thing to watch. And we now have a, a nice, a robust tradition, a three-year-old, four-year-old tradition of hawks hunting in our yard. 
Um, our parking strip out front, we converted to wildflower and tall grass. I want to say meadow, it's, it's like literally like this wide and about 15 feet long. But we get a lot of lizards out there now. We have a lot of birds moving through the Clarkia. Uh, the, uh, this, is, this is a bush tit. And bush tits will come through and they'll start at one end of the yard in this beautiful uh, little flock. They're tiny and attractive and they make this kind of little chime-like call. It's so much fun. And they'll move and they'll work through your native plants, pulling off, especially in springtime, all the little pests that are going after those new buds. And this is uh, something that I stumbled upon. I had no idea what I was looking at. Uh, this is a group of male longhorn summer bees. There's no real hive for them. So when they're out feeding on your, in this case, Cleveland sage, uh, and, and it starts to be, the sun starts to go down, they get cold, they can't fly anymore. They just grab on right there. You can see them grabbing on to the stem and that's where they go to sleep. So I have found that uh, the native plants get far more activity from these bees than the other plants that I used to have. And it also provides obviously nesting and perch for all of the things that we're talking about. So uh, that's in terms of biodiversity, we're kind of hitting on all levels. These creatures, I don't know what's up with these creatures. I don't know what they want. They, they come with weapons and I don't know, anyway, if anyone has an iNaturalist idea on those, I'm all for it. So in terms of being able to gauge the success of these gardens, I was lucky enough to be a part of the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles Bioscan Biodiversity Project. And that's the biggest urban biodiversity study that's ever been done in any city in the world. And, um, we're still trying to get straight data on this. I had the, the, so the information I'm about to relate to you is kind of anecdotal, uh, but native and water appropriate yards, first of all, had 30 to 50% more general biodiversity than traditional gardens. And what I thought was interesting about this is that people uh, you know, who had big fancy exotic gardens, tropical gardens, this kind of fantasy that people project on Los Angeles and they create these spaces that are utterly inappropriate for where we live. I actually, not just Los Angeles, I see it all over California. I see it all over San Diego and Riverside County and out at the coast, it's just maddening. But anyway, um, those gardens are not very biodiverse. They don't appeal to the species that are endemic to this region. They push them out, in fact. And so they were 30 to 50% more biodiverse than those traditional gardens, especially ones that use a great deal of water. And this test was this study was only recording flying insects. That's all it did. Insects would fly into this mesh and then go up and into this little bottle of ethanol through a tiny hole. So they were just gauging the biodiversity for flying insects. And the reason you do that is because insects are again, as per Doug Talamay's study and what we're learning about plant and species coevolution, they're the key fundamental layer for biodiversity, right? So if you don't have a lot of things flying around in your yard, um, you got a problem. We have a problem. We all have a problem. That means we're, we're, we're participating in ecosystem collapse. Pop, pop, pop. Oh yeah, and this is where, this is where red would hang out all the time too, which I thought was adorable. So one of the things that they discovered was that uh, in March of 2015, they announced a remarkable discovery. They discovered 30 new species of fly in, in Los Angeles, right? Which is pretty cool. Um, and why that matters to you and me is because <laughs> People think about pollinator gardens and they, or they'll put out some feeders or they'll put out just um, sugar water for hummingbirds. But about 6% of a hummingbird's diet is actually nectar. That, that's like, that's the fuel they need, but that's not everything they need to survive. The other 94% of a hummingbird's diet is flies. And so if you really wanna feed hummingbirds, create a biodiverse yard. First and foremost, create a space where all these base level insects can live below the soil and above the soil. And that will be the engine for all the biodiversity and the species above it. 
Um, I love Barbara Eisenstein. She wrote Wild Suburbia. I don't know if you can see me. I love this book. She had a great quote early on when I was interviewing people for the Wild Yards Project. Uh, she and I had a conversation and she was like, well, native plants don't really matter. And I was like, wait, what do you mean by that? And she said, let me be clear. And she wrote me this quote, and I'm, I'm just gonna read the whole thing. A garden comprised of only or even mostly native plants will provide little food or shelter for birds or insects if it's maintained using today's most common garden practices. Removing leaf litter, woody debris, using blowers, applying herbicides, insecticides, and heavily pruning trees, shrubs, it destroys habitat, regardless of plant selection. These common practices lead to a greater loss of biodiversity than plant provenance alone. And that's why native plants do not equal native habitat. Habitat is an act of compassionate defiance. And what I mean by that, that's a term I stole from Ben Vogt, who wrote um, A New Garden Ethic. And it, it's about putting these plants in juxtaposition such that they can create all the things essential to make habitat and make things want to live where you live. So we'll do a little checklist, we'll go really fast. And I hope, I hope this is okay for everybody. If anyone, if I'm moving too fast or if any, or if, you know, if any of this is too redundant, forgive me, but we're trying to put together a thesis here and I'll tell you why. So plant native plants, clean water access, it's essential for birds, bees, butterflies, and all kinds of species. And there's a lot of different ways you can do that. Uh, if you contact me on Wild Yards Project, I'll walk you through a lot of very affordable economic ways to create a space that provides flat, fresh, clean running water. Leaf litter and humus. Let your leaf litter lie, and I'll explain why. Water infiltration. Keep water on site. Put it in the ground. Healthy maintenance. Yeah, like don't leave seeds around on the ground and stuff for rats and things like that. Human health and safety. Uh, we'll go through these real fast. So we know plant native plants. Humus, which is overall soil health. When you let your leaf litter collect, um, you are sequestering carbon. You are creating a space for all the, the essential um, microfauna and mycorrhizal conditions to occur that make for a very healthy garden and a very healthy planet. Long-term deep soil carbon storage comes about through the creation of humus, the result of relationships between actively growing plants, fungi, soil microbes, and other critters in a matrix that includes mineral soil and organic matter. Leaf blowers destroy humus. Every time you see one blowing leaves out of a garden, they are killing the land. They're killing it every time. They kill off vital insects nesting and living in the leaf litter and they rob the soil of its capacity to sequester carbon. Humification builds topsoil while storing carbon in a stable form that can stay put for hundreds of years. Not blowing your leaf litter and creating healthy soil is one of the most powerful things you can do to com combat essentially global warming. And that's from the Ecological Landscape Alliance Water infiltration, humus also infiltrates water. That's a sponge-like layer that you're creating in your garden that allows uh, compost, that, that, that natural compost, it creates an in-situ absorbent permeable layer of topsoil, does a powerful job of absorbing water. When you get rid of that, when you use DG, when you use um, weed barrier, all of those things compact the soil and kill it. Please don't do it. If you, want your, if you want to designate your walking areas, I love this, they've designated their walking area, but their garden is alive. Healthy maintenance practices. When you, when you do a traditional garden, you're doing all those things we talked about before. It's not sustainable. You can't use 10 billion gallons of fresh water daily. Our planet cannot afford it. We use 80 million pounds of pesticides, 90 million pounds of chemical fertilizers. All of these things show up in the skin conditions of our children, of our pets. 5% uh, of our carbon emissions, again, come from leaf blowers and lawnmowers. 
A native habitat garden costs approximately one third to one fourth the cost of a traditional turf garden. So once you take on the practices of habitat garden, you have a much healthier space for all beings on the planet, essentially. Human health and safety, uh, this is my, that's my family walking up through the woods here in La Cañada. But it's all that there's tons of studies now that have proven that children and people playing in biodiverse spaces have less mental illness, far lower stress. And there's even a study right now that's about, about to be peer reviewed. Uh, it's in Science Advances that biodiverse green space may have a tendency to reduce crime. It chills people out. Biodiverse spaces chill people out. They're good for you. So, uh, oops, I jumped ahead of myself here. Sorry. Anyway, I'm gonna. I'll just go with it. I'm gonna. I'll go like this. So, sorry. So. I want to now that we've established the value of a biodiverse space. Let's let's go. Let's project this outwards. I just want to crack open everybody's heads and see if we can start to imagine how we can make this scalable and adaptable everywhere. I like this. This is a rooftop garden. This is an organization in Brooklyn. They're called Alive Structures, and they deal with disadvantaged and and, and, and social justice issues. And they try and bring these gardens to places that are completely underserved. Um, and I love this. They're very hard to build, they're, they're very tricky, but they're essential, I think, to cracking open your brain about what's possible in, in deep inner city areas. And I'm gonna go back, um, HOAs and realtor workshops. So this is uh, Marshall Villas. This was installed by Theodore Payne. Uh, Evan and Aaron over there, Theodore Payne sent me this image. They were very skeptical of doing a native habitat. Now they love it and they're exporting this idea to more HOAs. This is a realtor workshop where we teach realtors how to flip their property with native plant and habitat concepts in mind. Um, I think that it's very, it's very hard for a new homeowner to even like think about what they're gonna do with their outdoor space. They have so many other things on their mind, careers, kids, whatever. And so starting, uh, homeowners off on the right foot is to me essential. Food security. This is uh, Duran Chavez. He's an activist uh, back east and he says native plants are essential for successful food gardens and farms. Native plants for soil, health, pollinator habitat, and overall biodiversity. It's just a good thing. So more and more native plants are finding their way into the conversation of social justice and giving people the access to biodiversity and healthy food systems that they're being denied by the way things are set up at the moment, our current state. Eastside Communities for Environmental Justice, this is Janet Valenzuela. They do decentralized gardens because they don't have any big gardens down on the 710 corridor. The 710 corridor is impacted by all kinds of Superfund sites, toxic factories and things like that. And these communities are very negatively impacted by those things. And so what Eastside Communities for Environmental Justice is doing is creating decentralized gardens where families can grow different things and then share them and create this uh, a food network to combat food deserts. Um, and I'll just quote her, the use of native plants in low income neighborhoods is a practical way to connect people to the outdoors and the plants that once thrived in abundance here. Having native gardens, green space, sacred, sacred spaces that liberate us from harm, environmental threats, have a significant way of empowering community residents in a built environment. It allows for radical imagination for them to see what our environments can look like beyond industry and beyond environmental degradation. And I don't care what color your skin, I don't care who you voted for, I can promise anybody that once they begin to see California emerge in the form of these little ecosystems that we create with plants and animals, your mind can never go back. And that's what I see happening on a social justice level. I think it's a really beautiful, powerful thing. And these are ideas that can be exported and are being employed all across the country. 
habitat where no dirt exists at all. This is Anina Gerchik, and she's come up with a thing called BirdLink. And BirdLink is, these are completely adaptable, scalable ecosystems. It's an art piece. Yes, it's on a lawn here because it was being demoed in Brooklyn. But these are for courtyards. This is like for cement, urban landscapes. Um, she studies the native fauna of the region the native flora of the region. She builds these sites, they're, they're self-maintained and you can put them anywhere. So that builds upon current work designing for ecological challenges to maintain biodiversity in urban areas. The strategy is to build a landscape network that connects isolated habitats. So again, going back to that idea of fragmentation, you can compensate for gross fragmentation by creating these little islands for potential biodiversity and linking them up. One courtyard to one courtyard to one rooftop to one rooftop to one courtyard suddenly links, creates a wilderness corridor for migratory resident birds, bees, butterflies. Just like a, just like a yard, but it doesn't have to be a yard. When people think, what can I do? Here's one idea. So China right now and Singapore, the Singapore index is a biodiversity index that they stand by. China's come up with their own. And basically, if you don't meet certain standards and, you know, yeah, I mean, that's a, it's a tough political system. But in this case, uh, they're racing to incentivize biodiversity eliminating rebates for exports of over 550 products with high energy and resource consumption, establishing funds which require mining operators to deposit funds for ecological recovery, subsidies for forestry and ecological conservation, establish funds for forest ecological benefit, wetland e benefit. They're doing amazing work. This is a sponge city. This is a city that's built around the concept of water infiltration because water is a big issue there. This is Lizao Forest City, which they wanted, to, they're, they're building, they're constantly building, but they wanted to incorporate the existing fauna and ecosystems of the area. So they're importing them into the actual structure itself. This is an artist rendering. You can actually go to this site and look at where it is now. It's pretty incredible. Um, Quote from Chief Seattle, I know it's a bit of a cliche, but I think it's uh, extremely resonant and more timely than ever. Teach our children what we have taught our children, that the earth is our mother. Whatever befalls the earth befalls the sons of earth. If men spit upon the ground, they spit upon themselves. This we know, the earth does not belong to man. Man belongs to the earth. This we know. All things are connected, like the blood that unites one's family. All things are connected finding that essential connection right where we're standing, no matter what we're standing on, if we're standing on concrete, if we're standing on wood, if we're standing on soil, that essential, that essential connection to place and inviting the things that were there back in, that's the work ahead. And that's the work that I powerfully, powerfully believe can transform a lot of the things that are uh, going to impact us otherwise very negatively in the 21st century, and as we know here in Southern California and in the Southwest, already are. Um, real quick, what we do, we do inspiration, education, transformation. We use social media to connect people all over the, the country and give people what they need wherever they are. And we also do that via our website. We do community gardens here in Northeast LA. Um, I do consultation. I will go around, help people imagine what habitat can be where they live and help them get all the resources they need to do it. And I do, uh, I talk to realtors, as I mentioned before, and try and help them rethink the flip and rethink what blueprint they're giving um, the homeowner and frankly, what blueprint they're offering us for the 21st century. And that's it. And I have resource guides and all kinds of things on the website. We give realtors a guide to native plants. We give them an analog, the plants they normally use. And we say, how about you use this instead? And how you can help if anybody wants to help us, there's a donate site at fractured uh, at wildyardsproject.com. Um, we do a lot of outreach. We do a lot of local work and we can always really use the help. 
and 40 million acres of lawns, 10,000 species a year is lost. Whose yard space courtyard is next? That's my question. I'm back. How'd I do? I don't, I don't know how I did on time. I hope I didn't go on too long. Uh, no, I think that was just right, David. It was really great. Thank you for the inspiration. Um, I live in the desert in the Palm Springs area and we have um, taken the same path with a small yard to make it a really wildlife rich area. So that was great. That, yep. That's a great biome out there. I'd love to see that. You have to yeah. send picture. Well, your uh, comment about rocks for lizards was appreciated because yeah. we're uh, big lizard fans and we've got a lot and rocks make a big difference. Yeah, it's a game changer. Yep. Yeah, I um, mean, little things like a perch, like the other thing I do now, I have a container garden on my steps and I put a little thing full of water with a little water wiggler in to keep it moving. And I put a stick and it gets tons of activity now. Oh, but cool. Like, I like little, that. Yeah, little things make a giant difference. Yeah, I was just trying to think because it's really, really hot. I've been trying to think about more ways to put water out there. So, yeah, it's hard out there to evaporate so fast. Yeah, exactly. Um, so folks, if you have questions, you can put them in the Q&A. I have a couple questions for you, David. One is, someone wants to know, where did you, uh, Denise Mitchell wants to know, where did you get your toy on, Heteromelis arbutifolia? <laughs> uh, you know, uh, it was the, even before I really took the, the journey uh, into native plants, I was doing, I did do a little homework and I knew that I, I loved that shrub. Uh, I, and so I think that I got it from Theodore Payne. It was a long time ago. It's a six mm -hmm. years old. If I could walk the camera outside right now, it was about three feet tall when I got it. It's now 15 feet tall by 15 mm -hmm. feet wide. And it is covered. Uh, it's covered in the, in the most extraordinary diversity of, of bees and flies right now. It's oh, great. Wow. Yeah. great. Cool. Um, okay, let's see. I just have a comment. Thank you. But that person, um, if they want to write me through Instagram, if they want to join, oh. there's, and I'll find out where they are because Artemisia Nursery has them, uh, Plant Material has them, Theodore Payne has them. I mean, Tree of Life and all, all these places have them. I can, I can help them. Okay. Unless it's sold out, maybe not. they can, they're, they're, they're welcome to just contact me and I'll talk to them about it. Great. Maybe at the end, we can just remind folks how to do that again. Yeah. Um, so Jan Byers wanted to know about bark mulch for soil health. Um, she's in the Inland Empire where it's a lot drier. It helps reduce evaporation of a precious resource and keeps yeah. the dog cleaner in the winter. <laughs> um, um, but she said she doesn't leave any bare soil. Do you have a comment about bark mulch? Well, I mean, look, I'm, I'm no, you know, I don't have this down perfectly. Here's what mm -hmm. I would say. Um, Bark mulch is very hard for native bees to nest in. Over time, what, I, what I've been doing in my garden is replacing, once I have a few seasons with my native plants and there's enough leaf litter dropping, I don't use the bark mulch anymore. I would say um, if you can create areas, if you can think about, especially areas that get a little sun in the morning, um, that Eastern sun, uh, if you can think about maybe uh, exposing some earth, just expose it where you can. Um, I understand the, the need for bark mulch, but bark mulch with native plants, I, personally speaking, and I know a lot of people are going to be like, what? I don't actually buy that it's necessary, but it can, it does. I have used it in the past a lot. I've used it in the past and actually suffered for that and, I, and succeeded from that. And I, I'm happy to talk about that too. Um, it, but yeah, when, when your plants are getting started and you don't have a lot of leaf litter, you don't have that natural base layer of, of humus, basically what we we're talking about before, I can understand wanting to use it. It holds onto the water. It does a lot of nice things. But I would say to think about places where you don't need it and pull it away from there and uh, create a space. And I would also say throw logs, find logs and use them ornamentally, find as much wood as you can and lay that around, use it ornamentally. That's a really vital component in a habitat garden and it creates places for carpenter bees and, and a lot of other insects and things like that that are gonna help your garden. Great, okay. Um, Arlie Montalvo says, wonderfully inspirational talk, thank you. Um, did you say you give talks to school children and if not, it would be great for you to do so. 
Um, I, I, I haven't. I haven't given a talk to school children. I have. Uh, I have a community garden here that I created in, in Eagle Rock, um, but no, I haven't. I, I, am, I am working on a school curriculum uh, that I'm going to pitch in the fall. Uh, we just had a little turnover here at our school with the principal, so that got delayed. There's So I've been trying to communicate with um, biologists and bi biology teachers who are doing amazing habitat gardens around California to put together a curriculum that I'm going to pitch at our school here. But, um, you know, talking to kids, I think it's the sweet spot. There's a certain age where I found it to be too young when I did I first try to do that. Um, but I think talking to older elementary school kids and high school kids is a really good thing. And I'm happy to do it. Okay. Um. Another comment from Linda Byrne. She says, thank you for the presentation. We are new homeowners and want to create a native garden. Well, and now I want to create a habitat garden instead. This was deeply touching to me. Thank you. <clears throat> oh, good, good, good. I, I, I think, you know, the, I want to be very clear that, that the reason that Singapore and China and, and like certain, you know, authoritative governments are, are saying biodiversity because everything else falls under that. That when you when you design for biodiversity, you're doing you're making a far more efficient system. That's really what you're doing. And so, to me, this whole conversation needs to move out of the lifestyle section of the newspaper. You know, this has to be about how these are. This is a, a powerful tool, along with solar, along with electric cars. This is a this is an essential tool for altering our trajectory on the planet. And so when you garden for biodiversity, you're, you're, you're putting your foot down and uh, you are supporting both your wallet and your family health and the flora and fauna of the region. And, and it just, it, it, to me, it hits every other thing that you would worry about with a garden, cost, maintenance, all that stuff. Great. Um I have a, there aren't any other questions, but if anybody wants to ask them, please um, go ahead and type those into the Q&A. Um, David, I was going to ask, I was very interested in your presentations to realtors. I'm just curious, um, kind of what is the pitch with respect to Habitat Gardens and how is that received? Well, the talk is received really well. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm not running out and, uh, and then asking them to follow up. I, I can say that about four realtors are always gifting my, I'll do a, um, I'll do a site. I, I do consultation and I use that uh, as a way to sort of generate money for the Wild Barrett's project. So I will show up at people's homes and I'll, I'll look at what they have going on and I'll try to help them envision what's possible. And then I do a follow-up and I do a whole like multi-phased kind of document for them to help them do whatever they need to do to transform mm -hmm. the property into biodiversity space. So, uh, I have a handful of realtors who basically gift that um, whenever they sell a house. That's great. So that's the first thing I do. I go meet with their new client and I, yeah. and I help them with that. Or I, you know, or I just do that for people around Sunday. That's a tremendous idea, a great place for outreach. Um, I'm just going to repeat a question that was answered in the Q&A, which is, could you spell or write the link to the Xerxes Society? Um, and uh, just for yeah. folks, I'm, I'm just going to say, I'll, maybe you could just um, spell that out, David, for folks. Yeah, so it, I'm sure there's X, interest. It's X E R C E S, right? Yeah. I think it's just .org, right? I believe that's right. Sorry. I keep meaning to put together a document for all these references, but also the books. Um, I have, you know, I have a really, I, I was doing book reviews and publishing them on the site and then I just got, I got COVIDed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> COVID swept away. And so I'm starting to do that, revitalize the site and repopulate it because there's just so many amazing books that I highly recommend, both mm -hmm. on an educational inspirational level, but also on a resource level. Um, great. No, I think, and we'll try to post some resources too. We can put a few um, links to your website and other things on our website as well. Yeah. So if anybody there. wants an itemized list of maybe some books and, and if there's anything else that they had questions about, again, just join the Wild Yards project on Instagram. 
I don't, I have, there's a, there's a wild Nerds group on Facebook. I, I, I don't go to Facebook too much. Um, even though Facebook owns Instagram, I just don't go to, <laughs> but I will. I mean, I, I do check it weekly and follow up if anybody has any questions. Well, and our, um, whatever gets posted on our Facebook goes on Instagram too. So we could put it out there. Great. Um, okay. So um, let's see. Arlie Montalvo says, you've convinced me to add a water source to my garden. Absolutely. So everybody, <laughs> everybody put a water source. Uh, um, so here's, go ahead. yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, there's, so, you know, there's a lot of different ways to skin that cat. I actually did a little story. It's on my YouTube. I think I, I didn't migrate it to Instagram yet, but there's a lot of different ways to do it. I have, you know, in my front garden, which is there right by the street, obviously I'm not going to do anything too ornate. I have a little 18 inch uh, shallow bowl, clay bowl. It's only about that deep. Mm -hmm. And I put a rock in it so that, you know, the, the big thing about water is variable depths and availability, you know, so because bees will just come to the edge and some, you know, birds, like nobody needs a lot of water, you know, unless you have ducks. You have ducks, I can't help you. I don't know how to raise them. <laughs> but most birds just want like that much water. You know, they, they're, they're terrified, right? They don't want to be bogged down. So they'll dip, they'll drink and they look up and then they'll rinse their head and their wings and they look up. They're really paranoid. Um, so I have a bowl that's about 18 inches wide. It's about that deep. And I put a thing in the middle called a water wiggler, which you can get at Amazon. Water wiggler at Amazon. Bezos. <laughs> um, and that works. It works really, really well. And then, you know, and if you want to spend more money, there's, there's really beautiful uh, bird baths that have a tank below it. They're made out of, they're made out of um, uh, concrete and they'll have an upper plate. Mine has a pattern in a, of water lilies and stuff, but basically all that really is is to create a diversity of depths from one inch to like nothing. And that way it gets a lot of bees, it gets a lot of wasps, it gets a lot of birds, it gets a ton of traffic. And what I like about that is there's still like five gallons of water kept nice below. And um, as, long as, you, as long as you keep that all running and you keep it cleaned out, I don't have an issue with mosquitoes or anything like that. And as I said in the little tray out front, I use a water wiggler. Mosquitoes don't like that much motion and birds love it. Birds are far more attracted to moving water than still water. That's a great um, suggestion. We have just like those um, terracotta trays that you'd put at the bottom of a yeah. pot and those work well, but um, the movement is a great idea. So yeah, thanks for that. A game, it's a game changer. That's great. Um, here's a question from Anonymous. Can a native habitat be created when you have a swimming pool? Yeah, why not? I mean, I, I uh, just, uh, I feel like this is a trick question. Yeah, in <laughs> fact, my friend, uh, you can you can check him out online. My friend Matthew Carnahan uh, has a tiny little lot in Mar Vista, and uh, he has a tiny little pool in his backyard, and it's actually salt water, which is really tricky. Um, and it, the whole thing's surrounded with native plants. Um, sometimes you want to do a little study and find out if you're going to use stuff like that. Uh, you know which which plants might be more tolerant. But for the most part, if you have a pool, you want to just make sure that you have a proper border, you have proper distance and places for that chlorinated water or that, or that salinated water to run off. And then beyond that, you can do, I mean, but absolutely, you can create a beautiful habitat. There's nothing to stop you at all. Great. Um, Arlie Montalvo, who's our, one of our board members, wanted to just mention we have a plant sale um, every fall in October. And we sell some of the books that you mentioned. So those would be offered during our online plant right. sale, which we'll be announcing a little bit later this summer. Um, sure. Here's another uh, comment from Jan Byers. Uh, Vic, thanks for giving a name to my wild looking front yard. <laughs> it is an untended, it's habitat. Um, but she also says she needs to add a water feature. So you've already yeah. got some good. Um, and then here's a question. Where did you get the bird bath with the tank when you were describing? The, 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 which one? The, the water feature, the bird um, oh. feature with the tank. The, the, yeah, uh, I, got mine from, uh, I got mine from a, a little shop here in Los Angeles in Atwater called Potted. They're not cheap. 
We're not cheap. The tank, the tank, there's a couple different ones. And also a uh, jackalope out in Burbank has an incredible selection of tanks. Um, I will say that if you, if you can do it, it's a very, very, very worthwhile thing to do. It demands less maintenance and it also just pound for pound, it's hard to beat the amount of wildlife that comes to a proper bird bath. Um, mm -hmm. One, and you want to have that, you know, what I like about those, just like the ones at Jackalope, they bubble in the middle and then they're very shallow and then they have a rim. So um, you'll just see a lot of wildlife at them. I've seen the ones at Jackalope that are kind of on a fluted base. And again, this is, these are, you know, these are big ticket items. You're talking like 300 bucks. Um, I've seen hawks. I've seen all kinds of birds at them. They love them. Great. Um, here's a question from Paul Rodriguez. I have Santa Cruz buckwheats that are pretty, but do not get any pollinator activity. I live in South San Diego County. It seems to me I should remove it and add something that that's more attractive to wildlife. How do you know they don't get pollinator activity? <laughs> yeah, um, I don't know, Paul, if you can, uh, I don't have a way for him to answer unless Paul, well, you wanna type in something, but maybe you could just comment. Um, I have them too. And they don't get as much activity as, um, one of the problems with my yard is what should be growing in my yard is exactly what grows down in my community garden, which is the California buckwheat, straight species. Um, the more straight the species is, the more hyper endemic to where you live. And calscape.org obviously has a really robust database for that. And I'm gonna tell you right off the bat, it's gonna be in Celia, California. Um, the better you'll do. But I have Ariaganum rubescens in my yard and I have the Shasta sulfur because my yard, is, I have this giant jacaranda tree on the east that borders 50% of my little backyard. So I don't get the amount of sun that the, that, that the actual um, chaparral right up above me gets. Um, so I have never been successful with hyper local species in my yard, except for the, the ones that are more shade tolerant like pitcher sage and things like that. They do great. And a lot of currants, a lot of the local rye bees do really well in my yard. But um, I, the other thing you need to remember with, with all buckwheats is that's a tiny, tiny flower. They, they cluster, but it's tiny. And so a lot of times you're not noticing the really small sweat bees, leaf cutter bees, and even smaller bees that are actually on the flower. So I would say, sure, like, I don't know how many you have, swap it out and get, get the most straight species you can for where you live because pound for pound, I can't, I mean, uh, buckwheat's crazy in, in terms of what it gets, but it is a small flower that is in a cluster. That's why I, I'm, I'm a big fan of plant diversity, flower size diversity, the pitcher plant, you know, pitcher sage has a very certain flower. Uh, all the California fuchsias have that incredibly beautiful fluted flower, um, Dahlia multiradiata, you know, all these different, so the more diversity you have, um, the penstemons and things like that, um, the more diversity of, of, of pollinators you'll have. But I would also say like, and, and forgive me, I think your first name was Paul. Um, mm -hmm. Forgive me if I'm, if I'm telling you what you already know. The one thing I would say is sometimes you gotta just sit with it just sit and watch it because the, a lot of times the bees that come to uh, certain buckwheats are small. They're pretty small bees. And that's not true of my, of the big California buckwheat I have at the community garden. It's just, it's covered in everything. It's amazing. Great. Um, yeah, Paul just commented, it didn't seem to get a lot of activity. So no, no. Yeah, well, I mean, try, try, I mean, swap it out. I, you know, I don't like to say that because it takes like my Cali my Santa Cruz took so long to grow. So I'm like, ah, don't pull it out. You know, I might, I have three that are like, you know, giant now. And now you're making me think I got to go watch them closer, which I never <laughs> will. So Paul says, thanks. <laughs> okay. Great. Um, I don't have any more questions, um, it looks like, unless there's any last minute questions. But folks, if you wanted to um, reach out to David, you can do that with um, Wild, Wild Yards Project on Instagram, right? That's the best way. To yeah, I think you. that's the best way for me. And you can also uh -huh. send me an email at wildyardsproject at gmail. 
Okay. Um, Great. And, and more than anything, you know, I hope, I hope that this talk uh, is, is one making, you know, messengers of us all and, and cracking people's heads open about what's possible and where it's possible. You know, that, that's really the most important thing is you can create a space for these things almost anywhere. And it, when we think about fragmentation and we think about the extent to which we've pushed everything away, creating that space wherever you can and making that adaptable and scalable to the communities, mm -hmm. how they need them, you know, how do they need them? What's important to them? You know, I, I'm trying to be a better listener and I'm trying to help solve problems for people. And that's, uh, that's where it's at. And, and the opportunity, the, the possibility of that is limitless in my opinion. But I do think that intentional wildness is how we thread the eye of the needle uh, for what's going to happen in the 21st century. Yeah. So some of it we can't get away from. Well, but I think you're demonstrating that um, we as individuals can make a difference. And as you said, who's next in terms of right. um, taking your yard and making it into a habitat garden? Because I know yeah. we've seen the same thing in our yard, the birds and the snakes and the lizards and yeah. insects. It's really great. We have to. There, there's too much of us. <laughs> We're yeah. here and uh, we've taken over. You know, the age of Anthropocene is upon us. So let's now invite everything back in. I, I actually find that to be a pretty wonderful challenge. Mm -hmm. I actually find the idea of intentional wildness incredibly exciting. Well, this has been really inspiring, David. Thanks very much. And uh, we will be posting this for those. And um, we'll send out around a note because I'm sure folks who weren't able to join this morning would like to listen and it was really tremendous and thanks very much for uh, answering all the questions and inspiring us with your uh, great work in wild yards absolutely and thanks everybody for showing up great bye-bye take care